A Mother in Manville by Marjorie Kennan Rawlings. The orphanage is high in the Carolina mountains. Sometimes in the winter, snowdrifts are so deep that the institution is cut off from the village below, from all the world. Fog hides the mountain peaks and snow swirls down the valleys and a wind blows so bitterly that the orphanage boys who take the milk twice daily to the baby cottage reach the door with fingers stiff in an agony of numbness. Or when we carry trays from the cooking house to the ones that are sick, Jerry said, we get our face frostbit because we can't put our hands over them. I have gloves, he added. Some of the boys don't have any. He liked the late spring, he said. The rhododendron was in bloom, a carpet of color across the mountainsides, soft as the May winds that stirred the hemlocks. He called it laurel. It's pretty when the laurel blooms, he said. Some of it's pink and some of it's white. I was there in the autumn. I wanted quiet isolation to do some troublesome writing. I wanted mountain air to blow out the malaria from too long in the subtropics. I was homesick too for the flaming maples in October, for the corn shocks and pumpkins and black walnut trees of the lift of hills. I found them all living in a cabin that belonged to the orphanage half a mile beyond the orphanage farm. When I took the cabin, I asked for a boy or man to come and chop wood for the fireplace. The first few days were warm. I found what wood I needed about the cabin. No one came and I forgot the order. I looked up from my typewriter one late afternoon, a little startled. A boy stood in the door and my pointer dog, my companion, was at his side and had not barked to warn me. The boy was probably 12 years old, but undersized. He wore overalls and a torn shirt and was barefooted. He said, I can chop some wood today. I said, but I have a boy coming from the orphanage. I'm the boy. You, but you're small. Size don't matter chopping wood, he said. Some of the big boys don't chop good. I've been chopping wood at the orphanage for a long time. I visualized mangled and inadequate branches for my fire. I was well into my work and not inclined to conversation. I was a little blunt. Very well, there's the ax. Go ahead and see what you can do. I went back to work, closing the door. At first, the sound of the boy dragging brush annoyed me. Then he began to chop. The blows were rhythmic and steady, and shortly I had forgotten him, and the sound no more of an interruption than a consistent rain. I suppose an hour and a half passed, for when I stopped and stretched and heard the boy's steps on the cabin's stoop, the sun had already sun was dropping behind the farthest mountain and the valleys were purple with something deeper than the asters. The boy said, I have to go to supper now. I can come again tomorrow evening. I'll pay you now for what you've done, thinking I should probably have to insist on an old, older boy. Ten cents an hour? Everything's all right. We went together back of the cabin. An astonishing amount of solid wood had been cut. There were cherry logs and heavy roots of rhododendron and blocks from the waste pine and oak left from behind the building of the cabin. You've done as much as a man, I said. This is a splendid pile. I looked at him actually for the first time. His hair was the color of the corn shocks and his eyes, very direct, were like the mountain sky when rain is pending, gray with a shadowing of that miraculous blue. As I spoke, a light came over him, as though the setting sun had touched him with the same suffused glory which, with, with which it touched the mountains. I gave him a quarter. You may come back tomorrow, I said, and thank you very much. He looked at me and at the coin and seemed to want to speak, but could not and turned away. I'll split kindling tomorrow, he said over a thin ragged shoulder. You'll need kindling and medium wood and logs and backlogs. At daylight, I was half awakened by the sound of chopping. Again, it was so even in texture that I went back to sleep. When I left my bed in the cool morning, 
The boy had come and gone, and a stack of kindling was neat against the cabin wall. He came after school in the afternoon and worked until time to return to the orphanage. His name was Jerry. He was 12 years old, and he had been at the orphanage since he was four. I could picture him at four, with the same grave gray-blue eyes and the same independence? No, the word that comes to me is integrity. The word means something very special to me, and the quality for which I use it here is a rare one. My father had it, and there's another of whom I'm almost sure. But almost no man of whom I'm Almost no man of my acquaintance possesses it with the clarity, the purity, and the simplicity of a mountain stream. But the boy Jerry had it. It is bedded on courage, but it's more than brave. It's honest, but it's more than honesty. The axe handle broke one day. Jerry said the wood shop at the orphanage would repair it. I brought money to pay for the job, and he refused it. I'll pay for it, he said. I broke it. I brought down the axe careless. But no one hits accurately every time, I told him. The fault was in the wood of the handle. I'll see the man from whom I bought it. It was only then that he would take the money. He was standing back of his own he was standing back of his own carelessness. He was a free will agent and he chose to do careful work. And if he failed, he took the responsibility without subterfuge. And he did for me the unnecessary thing, the gracious thing that we find done by only the, the great of heart. Things no training can reach, for they're done on the instant with no predicated experience. He found a cubby hole beside the fireplace that I had not noticed. There, of his own accord, he put kindling and medium wood so I might always have dry wood material ready in case of a sudden wet weather. A stone was loose in the rough walk to the cabin. He dug a deeper hole and steadied it, though he, although he came himself by the shortcut over the bank. I found that when I tried to return his thoughtfulness with such things as candy and apples, he was wordless. Thank you was perhaps an expression for which he had no use, for his courtesy was instinctive. He only looked at the gift and at me, and a curtain lifted, so I saw deep into the clear well of his eyes, and gratitude was there, and affection soft over the firm granite of his character. He made simple excuses to come and sit with me. He would no more have turned him away. I would could no more have turned him away than if he had been physically hungry. I suggested once that the best time for us to visit was just before supper, when I left my writing. After that, he waited always until my typewriter had been some time quiet. One day, I worked until nearly dark. I went outside the cabin, having forgotten him. I saw him going up over the hill in the twilight toward the orphanage. When I sat down on my stoop, a place was warm from his body where he had been sitting. He became intimate, of course, with my pointer, Pat. There was a strange communion between a boy and a dog. Perhaps they possessed the same singleness of spirit, the same kind of wisdom. It's difficult to explain, but it exists. When I went across the state for a weekend, I left the dog in Jerry's charge. I gave him the dog whistle and the key to the cabin and left sufficient food. He was to come two or three times a day and let out the dog, feed and exercise him. I could return Sunday night and Jerry would take out the dog for the last time Sunday afternoon and then leave the key under an agreed hiding place. My return was belated and the fog lifted the mountain passes, and the fog filled the mount, mountain passes so treacherously that I dared not drive at night. The fog held the next morning, and it was Monday noon before I reached the cabin. The dog had been fed and cared for that morning, and Jerry came early in the afternoon, anxious. The superintendent said nobody sh would drive in the fog, he said. I came just before bedtime last night and you hadn't come, so I brought Pat some of the, my breakfast this morning. I wouldn't have kept let anything happen to him. I was sure of that. I didn't worry. When I heard about the fog, I thought you'd know. He was needed for work at the orphanage and he had to return at once. I gave him a dollar in payment and he looked at it and went away. 
But that night he came to the darkness and knocked on the door. Come in, Jerry, I said, if you're allowed to be away this late. I told maybe a story, he said. I told them I thought you would want to see me. That's true, I answered, and I saw his relief. I want to hear about how you managed with the dog. He sat by the fire with me, with no other light, and told me of their two days together. The dog lay close to him and found a comfort there that I did not have for him. And it seemed to me that being with my dog and caring for him had brought the boy and me too together so that he felt that he belonged to me as well as to the animal. He stayed right with me, he told me, except when he ran in the laurel. He likes the laurel. I took him up over the hill and we both ran fast. There was a place where the grass was high and I lay down in it and hid. I could hear Pat hunting for me. He found my trail and he barked. When he found me, he acted crazy and ran around and around me in circles. We watched the flames. That's an apple log, he said. It burns the prettiest of any wood. We were very close. He was suddenly impelled to speak of things he had not spoken of before, nor had I cared to ask him. You look a little bit like my mother, he said, especially in the dark by the fire. But you were only four, Jerry, when you came here. You've remembered how she looked all these years? My mother lives in Manville, he said. For a moment, finding that he had a mother, shocked me as greatly as anything my life has ever done, and I did not know why it disturbed me. Then I understood my distress. I was filled with a passionate resentment that any woman should go away and leave her son. A fresh anger added itself. A son like this one. The orphanage was a wholesome place. The executives were kind, good people, and the food was more than adequate. The boys were healthy. A ragged shirt was no hardship, nor the doing of clean labor. Granted, perhaps, that the boy felt no lack, what blood fed the bowels of a woman who did not yearn over his, this child's lean body that had come in partruition out of her own. At four, he would have looked the same as now. Nothing, I thought, nothing in life could change those eyes. His quality must be apparent to an idiot, a fool. I burned with questions I could not ask. In any, I was afraid there would be pain. Have you seen her, Jerry, lately? I see her every summer. She sends for me. I wanted to cry out. Why are you not with her? How can she let you go away again? He said, she comes up here from Manville whenever she can. She doesn't have a job now. His face shone in the firelight. She wanted me to have a puppy, but they can't let me one boy keep a puppy. You remember the suit I had on last Sunday? He was plainly proud. She sent me that for Christmas. The Christmas before that, he drew a long breath, savoring the memory. She sent me a pair of skates. Roller skates? My mind was busy making pictures of her, trying to understand her. She had not then entirely deserted or forgotten him. But why then? I thought I must condemn, not condemn her without knowing. Roller skates. I let the other boys use them. They're always borrowing her, but they're careful of them. What circumstances other than poverty? I'm going to take the dollar you gave me for taking care of Pat, he said, and buy her a pair of gloves. I could only say, that will be nice. Do you know her size? I think it's eight and a half, he said. He looked at my hands. Do you wear an eight and a half, he asked. No, I wear a smaller size, a six. Oh, and I guess her hands are bigger than yours. I hated her. Poverty or no, there was, no, there was other food than bread and the soul could starve as quickly as the body. He was taking his dollar to buy gloves for her big stupid hands, and she lived away from him in Manville and contented with sending herself with sending him skates. She likes white gloves, he said. Do you think I can get them for a dollar? I think so, I said. I decided I should not leave the mountains without seeing her and knowing for myself why she had done this thing. 
The mind scatters its interests as though made of thistle down, and every wind stirs and moves it. I finished my work. It did not please me, and I gave my thoughts to another field. I should need some Mexican material. I made arrangements to close my Florida place, Mexico immediately, and doing the writing there if conditions were favorable. Then Alaska with my brother. And after that, have a new what or where. I did not take time to go to Manville to see Jerry's mother or even talk with the orphanage officials about her. I was a trifle absorbed, uh, abstracted about the body. I was a trifle abstracted about the boy because of my work and plans. After my first fury at, at her, we did not speak her, of her again. His having a mother, any sort at all, not far away in Manville, relieved me of the ache I had about him. He did not question the anomalous relation. He was not lonely. It was not of my concern. He came every day and cut my wood and did small favors and stayed to talk. The days had become cold and often I let him come inside the cabin. He would lie on the floor in front of the fire with one arm across the pointer and they would both doze and wait quietly for me. Other days they ran with common ecstasy through the laurel and since the asters were now gone, he brought me back vermilion maple leaves and chestnut boughs dripping with imperial yellow. I was ready to go. I asked him, I said to him, you have been my friend, Jerry. I shall think often of you and miss you. Pat will miss you too. I'm leaving tomorrow. He did not answer. When he went away, I remembered that a new moon hung over the mountains and I watched him go in silence up the hill. I expected him the next day, but he did not come. The details of packing my personal belongings, loading my car, arranging the bed over the seat where the dog would ride, occupied me until late in the day. I closed the cabin and started the car, noticing that the sun was in the west and I should do well to be out of the mountains by nightfall. I stopped by the orphanage and left the cabin key and the money for my bill with Miss Clark. And will you tell, will you call Jerry? for me to say goodbye to him. I don't know where he is, she said. I'm afraid he's not doing well. He didn't eat his dinner this noon. One of the other boys saw him go, going over the hill into the laurel. He was supposed to fire the boiler this afternoon. It's not like him. He's usually reliable. I was almost relieved for I would never see him again and it would be easier not to say goodbye to him. I said, I wanted to talk with you about his mother, why he's here, but I'm in more of a hurry than I expected to be. It's out of the question for me to see her now too, but here's some money I'd like to leave you with, with you to buy things for him at Christmas and on his birthday. It will be better for, than for me to try to send him things. I could so easily duplicate the skates, for instance. She blinked her honest spinster's eyes. There's not much use for skates here, she said. Her stupidity annoyed me. <clears throat> what I mean, I said, is that I don't want to duplicate things his mother sends him. I might have chosen skates if I didn't know she had already given them to him. She stared at me. I don't understand, she said. He has no mother. He has no skates.